Heavenly Father, once again, we ask that you would direct this presentation um, to our hearts and our minds in an easy and simple fashion. Uh, we do not want to be deceived. That's one of the things that we, you've warned us about at the end of the world. We ask that you would make our discernment um, strong. We ask that what is done from up front here would be for your glory and honor, and that we could understand these things in such a way that it would change us, that this would be a Sabbath we could look back to and say this is um, where the Lord pushed me forward in the work. And we want to be part of that work, so once again we ask that you do whatever it takes in our individual lives to make it happen. And we thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. The last presentation was Christ the Other Angel, and this is titled Christ the Man in Linen, and this is to show that Daniel 12 is another prophetic line of this history of 1840 to 1844. I ha personally haven't come across a statement from Sister White that, that teaches specifically what this particular prophetic history in Daniel 12, what its theme is. If what, what she says the theme of the parable of the ten virgins is, is it's illustrating the experience of God's people. The theme of, of the seven thunders is demonstrating the part that Christ plays in this history. And the theme of these angels, the three angels' message, followed by the fourth angels' message, is emphasizing the work that takes place in this history. The work is accomplished by the people of God, but it's symbolized by angels in Bible prophecy. For me, the theme of Daniel 12 is emphasizing the role of the books of Daniel and Revelation, the, the prophetic sources of, of understanding, because in Daniel 12 there is an increase of knowledge. This understanding comes from the books of Daniel and Revelation, and it's what prepared the Millerites to accomplish their work, and it, what, it is what prepares the 144,000 to accomplish their work. So although I don't have a statement where Sister White m makes that claim, that's how I understand it could be wrong. But it's not redundant. We'll, we'll go through it. Here's um, Daniel 12, bottom of page 52. We'll, we'll read some of the verses from Daniel 12 here. Starting in verse 3, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as stars forever and ever. Um, <clears throat> the wise in the Millerite time period are also called the wise virgins in the parable of the ten virgins. In Daniel 12, they're simply called the wise. And in Daniel 12, the foolish virgins of the parable of the ten virgins, in Daniel 12, they're not called foolish. What are they called? Wicked. We will see that as we go on. The, the, the division between uh, the wise and the foolish in Daniel 12 is the wise and the wicked. But one thing I like to note here for us as we pass this first verse is that if you have a marginal reference in your Bible for this word wise, what does it say? It says teachers. The wise in Daniel 12 that are symbolizing 144,000, one of the truths that that's conveying to us is that every one of God's people at the end of the world is going to be involved with teaching this message. You're not going to be among the wise if you're not participating in the work of sharing this message. And, and you'll find it's when you begin to share the message that you begin to grow. You begin to be cleansed and purified, which is part of the story of Daniel 12. But anyway... And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Then I looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, 
which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, that it shall be for a time, a times, and a half. And when he shall accomplish to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And I heard, but I understood not. Then I said, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are, cl are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. But go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest, and shall stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Daniel 12, 4 through 13. Now there's, there's uh, <clears throat> much to be said about that, but let's, Let's remind ourselves something here. The last vision of Daniel is Daniel 10, 11, and 12. Daniel chapter 10, chapter 11, and chapter 12 are the same vision. The translators of the King James Bible, the translators of the Bible, when they translated the book of Daniel, they broke Daniel's vision up into three chapters. So Daniel 12 is, is began. <coughs> Excuse me. In Daniel 10. And we just read, one of the things that we're emphasizing in what we just read is this man clothed in linen. In, or, in order to identify who this man clothed in linen is, I want to go back into the very beginning of the vision in chapter 10. So you'll see verses um, 4 through 11 of chapter 10. This is the same vision. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is the Hittical, then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphaz, his body was as like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Who is this? This is Christ. Christ is the man clothed in linen. Christ is the other angel. Christ is the mighty angel. Um, continuing on. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision. And by the way, brothers and sisters, in the book of Daniel, there are two Hebrew words that are translated as vision. It is important that God's people understand the distinction between those two words. It's important. And we're, we have more to say on that, particularly tomorrow when we take up part two of this presentation. But there are two Hebrew words that are both translated vision. And Daniel here uh, is, he sees this vision. And, and this particular vision is a vision that's emphasizing the vision of Jesus Christ in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. We will show that later. It's not the vision that is dealing with the entire vision of how God's people are trampled down by paganism and papalism. We will make some points about this tomorrow, but it was worth at least mentioning that in passing here. So back to the, the reading. I, and I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them so that they hid themselves, so they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in, in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face towards the ground. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, Understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. You'll see a quote here from Sister White, and on, right after this, uh, she's speaking about the verses we just read, and then in the paragraph, the second paragraph there, it says, No less a personage than the Son of God appeared to Daniel. 
It's the same word she used for the mighty angel of Revelation 10. She said, no less a personage than Jesus Christ was the mighty angel of Revelation 10. And Jesus Christ is also the man clothed in linen in Daniel 12. And you'll notice that in Revelation 10, Jesus Christ, in verses uh, 5 and 6, what did he do? He lifted up his hands to heaven and swear by him that liveth for and ever and ever that there should be time no longer. He does this same action here in in chapter 12, when he lifted up his hands. It's the same person. So no less than a person needs in the Son of God appeared to Daniel. This description is similar to that given by John when Christ was revealed, revealed to him upon the Isle of Patmos. Our Lord now comes with another heavenly messenger to teach Daniel what would take place in the latter days. This knowledge was given to Daniel and recorded by inspiration for us upon whom the ends of the world are come. Right there, Sister White is saying that the last vision of Daniel, chapters 10, 11, and 12, is for us at the end of the world. Is that, is that not how you understand it? This vision is giving for us upon, that are living at the end of the world. The great truths revealed by the world's Redeemer are for those who search for truth as for hid treasures. Daniel was an aged man. His life had been passed amid the fascinations of a heathen court, his mind cumbered with the affairs of a great empire, yet he turns aside from all these to afflict his soul before God and seek a knowledge of the purposes of the Most High. And in response to his supplications, light from the heavenly courts was commissioned for those who should live in the latter days. Daniel's faithfulness. I mean, how many people did you expect to be here today? If you could talk to all of them, they all will have legitimate reasons for not being here. Daniel was running the empire, but he took time to seek the Lord. And because of his faithfulness, he was given light that is for you and I here in the last days. But you and I here in the last days, we can't get our priorities so we can come and consider these things that were recorded for us because of Daniel's faithfulness. What, with what earnestness, then, should we seek God that he may open our understanding to comprehend the truths brought to us from heaven? And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. And there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned into, in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Now notice this, brothers and sisters. Such will be the experience of everyone who is truly sanctified. Here in Daniel 10, when Daniel has a confrontation to where he sees Jesus Christ and he collapsed in the ground because he realized he's so corrupted and so worthless and he falls at his feet, Sister White says, such will be the experience of everyone who is truly sanctified. Slip, slip, go over to the next page, and in the last paragraph of this quote, it says, Daniel was a devoted servant of the Most High. His long life was filled up with noble deeds of service for his masters. His purity of character and unwavering fidelity are equaled only by his humility of heart and his contrition before God. We repeat, the life of Daniel is an inspired illustration of true sanctification. In Daniel's last vision, chapters 10 through 12, Daniel is not Daniel. In Daniel's last vision, chapters 10 through 12, Daniel is symbolizing God's people at the end of the world. It's, that's what he's doing. And prophets do that, and you know that. You know that. We've studied it today. In Revelation chapter 10, when John, who received the, the vision of Revelation, when he was told, go take the little book out of the hand of the angel and eat the little book, and it was sweet in his mouth but bitter in his stomach, was that John the Revelator? No, it was John representing the Millerite movement that came to understand the book of Daniel. Prophets are used to illustrate God's people at the end of the world. And Sister White is trying to emphasize here that in Daniel's last vision, Daniel 
is a symbol of everyone that's truly sanctified and that this last vision is for God's people at the end of the world and everyone at the end of the world that truly has this experience she says, we repeat, is symbolized by Daniel in Daniel's last vision. Everyone that's among the 144,000 will have a personal experience with Jesus Christ. You're not going to get to heaven because your wife understands these things. You're not going to get to heaven because your dad understands these things, or your husband understands these things, or your neighbor understands these things. You're not going to get to heaven even if you understand these things. You don't simply have to understand them. You have to have a personal experience with Jesus Christ where you're humbled in the dust and then he comes and empowers you. That's what Daniel's symbolizing here. That truth of the Daniel's last vision is just as important as the time prophecies in Daniel's last vision. It's just as important about who the king of the north is. It's even more important. Better to have the experience and not have the understanding than to have the understanding and not have the experience. I don't think they're separated with 144,000, but I don't want to downplay the experience. Okay. In page 55, what shall befall thy people? Gabriel now, the same vision, Gabriel is speaking to Daniel. And he comes to him in verse 14. He says, now I'm come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. Brothers and sisters, Daniel's last vision is an illustration of what happens to God's people at the end of the world. That's what it says in verse 14. You don't need Ellen White to tell you that. And you don't need to determine it on your own. Verse 14 says, this vision is telling you what happens to God's people at the end of the world. Do you see that? That's what this vision is all about. So who is this angel? I'm going to switch gears here just a minute. In Revelation 7, there's an angel that comes from the east. Who do we call that angel? Come on, we're Seventh-day Adventists. Who's the angel of Revelation 17? The sealing angel. The sealing angel of Revelation 7. Page 55. The angel of the covenant. And what a representation is given in Revelation 7 for our consideration and comfort and encouragement. The four angels are commissioned to do a work upon the earth. But one who purchased the world by giving himself for its ras ransom has a chosen few. Who? Those are keeping all the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. John's attention was called to another scene. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. Who is this? The angel of the covenant. He comes from the sun rising. He is the day spring from on high. He is the light of the world. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. This is the one Isaiah describes, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his soldier, shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He cried as one who had superior, superiority over the host of angels in heaven, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in our foreheads. Here is the divine and human united. The command is given to the four angels to hold and check the four winds until they receive his summons. Read the entire chapter. The cry, hurt not, is uttered by the restorer, the redeemer. Brothers and sisters, the angel of Revelation 7 is Christ. The sealing angel is Christ. Christ is the mighty angel of Revelation 10. Christ is the mighty angel of Revelation 18. Christ is the man clothed in linen in Daniel's last vision, 10 through 12. In, in page 56, under the title, The Mightiest of Angels, another place where she's dealing with this um, same theme. So you go to the middle of the paragraph just to save some time, where it's in bold print. It says, the mightiest angel is seen ascending from the east. This is just more commentary on the, the sealing angel of Revelation 7. From the east or the sun rising. The mightiest of angels has in his hand the seal of the living God or of him who alone can give life, who can inscribe upon the foreheads the mark or inscription to whom shall be granted immortality, eternal life. It is the voice of this highest angel 
that had authority to command the four angels to keep and check the four winds until his work was performed and until he should give the summons to let them alone. The sealing angel is Christ. But where else do we find the sealing angel in the Bible besides Revelation 7? Uh, uh, we know this. Ezekiel 9. Ezekiel 9. The true people of God, one, one man clothed with linen. Now remember, in Daniel's last vision, the man clothed in linen is, is Christ. But now we're going to consider Ezekiel 8 through 12. There's a man clothed in linen in that passage. The true people of God who have the spirit of the work of the Lord and the salvation of souls at heart will ever view sin in its real sinful character. They will always be on the side of faithful and plain dealing with sins which easily beset the people of God, especially in the closing work for the church in the sealing time of the 144,000 who are to stand without fault before the throne of God, will they feel most deeply the wrongs of God's professed people. This is forcibly set forth by the prophet's illustration of the last work under the figure of each man having its slaughter weapon in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen with the rider's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Brothers and sisters, the man clothed in linen, the sealing angel, because Sister White says the sealing in Ezekiel is the same as the sealing in Revelation 7. The man clothed in linen is Christ. And the man clothed in linen, once again, in the history that's illustrated in Daniel's last vision, Daniel 12, it's the same angel, it's the same mighty angel that's in the history of the Millerite time period, whether you're considering the parable of the ten virgins or the fourth angel's message or the seven thunders. It's all accomplished by Christ. So, considering Daniel 12, there are certain phrases in Daniel 12 that, that are applied to the Millerite time period and are also applied to the end of the world. And when we take these phrases from Daniel 12 and see them applied to the Millerite time period and then at the end of the world, uh, if we can do that twice upon the testimony of two things established, then we will have established that Daniel 12 is an illustration of the Millerite time period and an illustration of the end of the world. It's another line of prophecy that's doing the same thing as the seven thunders, the parable of the ten virgins, or the three angels' message followed by the fourth. Another line of prophecy of the same history. So, um, standing in his lot in the Millerite time period. Testimonies to ministers in 115. Daniel stood in his lot to bear his testimony, which was sealed unto the time of the end when the first angel's message should be proclaimed to the world. When was Daniel still standing in his lot? August 11th, 1840. That's when it was empowered, even before that. He was standing in his lot in the first angel's message. And then the next quote says, These relate to future events, which will be disclosed in their order. Daniel shall stand in his lot at the end of the days. Standing in his lot in the Millerite time period, he stands in his lot at the end of the world. Um, there, another quote about Daniel standing in his lot. Let's start in the second paragraph of this quote. It says, as we near, this is on the bottom of page 57 in your notes, as we near the close of this world's history, the prophecies recorded by Daniel demand our special attention as they relate to the very time in which we are living. With them should be linked the teachings of the last book of the New Testament scriptures. Satan has led many to believe that the prophetic portions of the writing of Daniel and of John the Revelator cannot be understood, but the promise is plain that special blessings will accompany the study of these prophecies. The wise shall understand. Was spoken of the visions of Daniel that were to be unsealed in the latter days and of the revelation. Now, brothers and sisters, when did Sister White write this? I don't know. I don't need the year. But did she re write this before the Millerite time period or after the Millerite time period? After. So when she's talking about the latter days, she's putting this in the context of our day and age, not the Millerite time period, right? Follow it? She's saying that the wise are going to understand at the end of the world just like the wise understood in the Millerite time period. That's one of the phrases from Daniel 12, the wise will understand. Was spoken of the visions of Daniel that were to be unsealed in the latter days and of the revelation that Christ gave to his servant John for the guidance of God's people all through the centuries, the promise is, blessed is he that readeth, and that heareth the words of this prophecy, and keep those things that are written therein. 
we read when we started in Daniel 12 of a purification process. Daniel 12.10. For me, I don't have any place where Sister White says this, so I'm, I'm just using a, a prophetic, logical argument, but I don't have a spirit of prophecy statement to back this up. If you want to not receive this, feel free to do so. But in Daniel 12.10, it says, Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Daniel 12 is describing in the history of the Millerites and the history at the end of the world a purification process that took place then and is taking place now. And when he describes this purification process, I don't believe it's an accident that he mentions three types of purification process. He says, purified, made white, and tried. And for me, this is a symbol of the first, second, and third angel's message, which Sister White, in a variety of places, says were three tests during this time period. In fact, if you read very carefully, early writings, page 259, Sister White describes three tests that took place during the days of Christ in one paragraph. And as soon as she describes those three tests in the days of Christ, she immediately goes in to the history that we've been dealing with. And we've read part of it here today. We've read part of that quote where she says those people that rejected the first message could not be benefited by the second, nor were they benefited by the midnight cry that taught them the way into the most holy place. She takes the time period of Christ, she says there were three tests, and then she says those three tests prefigure three tests in the Millerite time period. And what does that mean? Well, it means that when you see Daniel talking about this history, both in the Millerite time period and at the end of the world, and when he's dealing with this purification process, and Daniel goes to the trouble to break the purification process in, into purified, tried, and made white, in my mind, He's saying first angel's message, second angel's message, third angel's message. It's a threefold test. Took place in the days of Christ. Took place in the days of Noah. Took place in the days of Moses. Took place several times in Scripture. And it took place in the Millerite time period. And brothers and sisters, there's a threefold test that takes place at the end of the world. And the tests are of such a nature. If you don't pass the first test, you're not involved with the second test. If you don't pass the second test, you're not around with the third. That's the way it was in Christ's day. That's the way it was in the Millerite time period. Upon the testimony of two, a thing shall be established. Read early writing, page 259. And Sister White says the parable of the dead and virgins has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. God's people at the end of the world have three tests. The third test in the Millerite time period was October 22, 1844. What happened? What happened on that time? that time period. That's part of it. But what happened in the parable of the ten virgins and the message to the Philadelphian church? The door closed. When this history is repeated at the end of the world, the third test for us at the end of the world takes place when the door closes on us. Where does the door close on us at the end of the world? At the Sunday law. Therefore, brothers and sisters, before the Sunday law, there are two tests for Seventh-day Adventists to come before the Sunday law. If we don't pass the first test, we're not involved with the second test. If we don't pass the second test, we're going to receive the mark of the beast if we live to the Sunday law time period. That's a truth that you can demonstrate very clearly. It's outside the scope of this study, but I want you to see, in my understanding, in Daniel 12, which is teaching about the Millerite time period and the time period of the 144,000, he emphasizes a threefold purification process, even if it seems a little bit stretched, but simply purified, made white, and tried. Um, and it's at this process where the wicked and the wise are discerned in Daniel 12. So um, you see after that, the purification process in the Millerite time period, that heading, Sister White quotes from Malachi 3, where the messenger of the covenant comes suddenly into the temple and uh, then she says, The coming of Christ is our high priest to the most holy place for the cleansing of the sanctuary, brought to view in Daniel 8, 14. The coming of the Son of Man to the Ancient of Days is presented in Daniel 7, 13. And the coming of the Lord to his temple, foretold by, Mal by Malachi, 
are descriptions of the same event. Here she takes three lines of prophecy, Malachi, Daniel 7, and Daniel 8, 14, and says this is the same history, the same event being portrayed with different aspects to broaden our understanding, are descriptions of the same event, and this is also represented by the coming of the bridegroom to the marriage described by Christ in the parable of the ten virgins. This history, this history cannot be, you can't, you must see in this history a purification process. It took place in the Millerite time period, the, the prophetic lines in the Bible that deal with this time period talk about a purification process. But in Malachi, the reason that I have this in here, go back up to Malachi 3, 1 through 4, which Sister White quotes. It says, Behold, I will send my messenger. I'm reading right before the quote I was just reading from the Great Controversy. I'm reading paragraph 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. When did the Lord suddenly come to his temple? October 22nd, 1844. We just read it. Sister White says this is the same event. So the Lord came to his temple on October 22nd, 1844, and Malachi is describing that event. Sister White just said so, but let's read on what Malachi said. The Lord whom you, whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, said the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. And he shall set as a refiner and a purifier of, his, of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering of righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, as in the former years. Brothers and sisters, go back and read that a couple of times. What I hope you see is that the Lord in Malachi comes to his temple and then begins a purification process. Now, we're talking about the purification process that took place in the Millerite time period, and it reached its conclusion when the Lord came to his temple. There was a purification process in the Millerite time period, but this is teaching us that it's a purification process that takes place in the time period of the 144,000. What we're trying to emphasize here is that the, the themes of truth that are in Daniel 12 are both identified as taking place in the Millerite time period, and they take place at the end of the world. Right now, the Lord is purifying the sons and daughters of Levi that he might have a church that's without spot or wrinkle. So th that purification process is repeated. Um, in, in that passage, there's a question. It says, but who may abide the day of his coming? Did you see that right in the middle in Malachi? But who may abide the day of his coming? You know, there's another place where that question is asked, all similar. It's in verse 17 of Revelation 6. Now, if you start in verse 13, verse 12 is the opening of the sixth seal, and verse 13 of Revelation 6 says, this is under the sixth seal. How many seals are there in Revelation in this passage? There's seven. The sixth seal is opened in verse 12. There's a great earthquake when it's opened in verse 12. What was that earthquake? The Lisbon, Portugal, Portugal earthquake. Okay. Um, and then in verse 13 it says, And the stars fell from heaven unto earth. When did the stars fall from heaven? 1833. William Miller receives credentials. The message is underway in history. And uh, verse 13 says, even as the fig tree casts her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind, and the heavens departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. When does that take place? When does the heaven get rolled back as a scroll? The second coming of Christ. So verse 13 takes us right to the beginning of the Millerite time period. And in verse 13, it jumps, in the sixth seal, it jumps all the way down to the end of the world. And why does it do that? Because it wants to ask a question. Verse 14 talks about the, the, the kings of the earth, the, the, the 
captains that are going to be punished during the second coming of Christ. And verse 16 says of these people, And said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. When's the wrath of the Lamb? Seven last plagues. So the sixth seal takes us to the Millerite time period, 1833, to the falling of the stars, and then it emphasizes the time period when human probation is closed. And then what does verse 17 say about this time period? For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And then chapter 7 tells who's able to stand. And chapter 7 is where the sealing angel Christ puts together the 144,000. So when Malachi talks about the angel of the covenant suddenly coming to his temple in October 22nd, 1844, and then he talks about a purification process that continues after that, he's emphasizing the purification process of the 144,000, for he asks the very same question that's asked here in the end of chapter 6 of Revelation. Who's able to stand during this time period? And the answer is the 144,000. The 144,000 go through the same purification process that the Millerites went through to the very letter. But things will be different. Things will be different. Uh, yeah, but it's the same. We're, in prophetic sense, it will be the same. Um, purification process in the time period of the 144,000. The remnant people of God who keep his commandments will understand the words spoken by Daniel. Many shall be purified and made white and tried. The 144,000 are going to go through this same process that's illustrated in Daniel 12. She's quoting from Daniel 12 here. The next quote, a double cleansing, we've already read, referred to a couple times in our studies. Jesus cleansed the temple twice when he was here on earth, the beginning and end of his ministry, and he cleanses his church at the beginning, his church at the end of the world, at the beginning of their existence in the Millerite time period, and he cleanses his church at the end with the 144,000. The cleansing process began here in the Millerite time period. One test, first angel's message. Next test, second angel's message. Third and final test, the people that, that were victorious at this test, they entered into the most holy place by faith with Christ. Fifty of the wise virgins. 49,950 foolish virgins lost their way. That was the purification process during that time period. This purification process is going to parallel identical. Identical. Takes place at the end with 144,000. There's once again going to be a message that the 144,000 are proclaiming. What was William Miller's message? Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. What are, what's our message? The third angel's message. A warning against keeping Sunday as opposed to keeping Sabbath. Comes the time period when this is empowered. Brothers and sisters, Daniel 11, verse 40, identifying the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989. This is a test question for God's people at the end of the world. If you don't see that, if you flunk that test, you're not going to see the test that follow. Last six verses of Daniel 11. People, people hey, do not like it to be articulated this way, but the last six verses of Daniel 11 are salvational. You can show it from a lot of different points of view. Another quote after that from Bible Training School um, talk, comparing this purification process of Daniel 12 at the end of time. Um, Daniel unsealed in Revelation. Daniel stood in his lot to bear his testimony. This is the bottom of page 59. Daniel stood in his lot to bear his testimony, which was sealed until the time of the end when the first angel's message should be proclaimed in, his, in our world. Daniel stood in his lot right here. These matters are of infinite importance in these last days. But while many shall be purified and made white and trite, the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand how true this is. Sin is the transgression of the law of God, and those who will not accept the light in regard to the law of God will not understand the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's message. The book of Daniel is unsealed in the revelation of John and carries us forward to the last scenes of earth's history. Will our brethren bear in mind that we are living amid the perils of the last days? Read 
Revelation, in connection with Daniel, teach these things. That's what we've been teaching here today. Could have been taught better, I'm certain. But this is what we're supposed to be considering, brothers and sisters. The first, second, and third angel's message, in a way, that unseals this history that was sealed up in the seven thunders. Because in Daniel 12, there's an unsealing for God's people. Sealed book in the Millerite time period. We've read that more than once. Book of Daniel unsealed. There's a sealed book in the time period in the 144,000. Revelation 10, verse 4. Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered. That's what gets unsealed at the end. That's what's being unsealed right now to your mind if you haven't considered these things before. The increase of knowledge. When the book of Daniel was unsealed in Daniel 12, there was an increase of knowledge. This unsealing of the book, there's an there's a intelligent, logical understanding of it. No one was understanding the book of Daniel. It was unsealed, and suddenly there was information coming from the book of Daniel. And you, we've read this quote earlier from the Great Controversy 356. The book of Daniel was unsealed in the Millerite time period. And these prophecies showed a progression of events leading down to the judgment. You can see that in the, in the middle of that paragraph. But there will be an increase of knowledge also in the last days. An increase of knowledge in the time period of 144,000. Bottom of page 60. The book that was sealed was not the book of Revelation, but that portion of the prophecy of Daniel which related to the last days. The scripture says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. When the book was opened, the proclamation was made, time shall be no longer. See Revelation 10.6. Where was the book of Daniel open? Revelation 10. That's what she's telling us very plainly. It was unsealed in Revelation 10. The book of Daniel is now unsealed. And the revelation made by Christ to John is to come to all the inhabitants of the earth. But notice this, by the increase of knowledge, a people is be, to be prepared to stand in the latter days. There's going to be an increase in knowledge at the end of the world, just like there was an increase of knowledge in the Millerite time period. That's what she says. She's quoting from Daniel here. She's quoting from Daniel 12, and then she says, by the increase of knowledge, a people will be prepared to stand in the last days. So there's an increase of knowledge, once again, in connection with Daniel 12, at the in the end of the world. And then she says, in the first angel's message, men are called upon to worship God, our creator, who made the world and all things that are therein. What did she just refer to? The first angel's message. When, was the first a when did the first angel's message come into history? Okay, so she's... She's talking about the increase of knowledge and she's connecting it with the first angel's message because Daniel stood in his lot at the first angel's message. Daniel standing in its lot has its proper place in the first, second, and third angel's message. We've read the quotes that say that today. Daniel stands in his lot in the first angel's message. It's in the first angel's message where you find the increase of knowledge and fulfillment of Daniel 12. And now she's talking about the increase of knowledge at the end of the world. And she refers this right to the first angel's message. And she says, the in the first angel's message, men are called upon to worship God, our creator, who made the world and all things that are therein. They have paid homage to an institution of the papacy making of no effect the law of Jehovah, but there is to be an increase of knowledge on this subject. The increase of knowledge that prepares God's people to stand in the latter days and parallels the increase of knowledge of the first angel's message has to do with the papacy and the Sunday law. That's what she said. The increase of knowledge from the book of Daniel for the Millerites was the understanding of the time prophecies in the book of Daniel and Revelation. This is their message. See all the numbers? Dealing with the, the time prophecies in the books of Daniel and Revelation. This was the increase of knowledge in this time period, but the increase of knowledge at the end of the world that comes 
in this time period here that prepares God's people to stand has to do with the papacy and the Sunday law. And brothers and sisters, verse 40 of Daniel 11 is the verse that tells you that the papacy has started the prophetic movements that return it to the throne of the earth and bring about the Sunday law. Daniel 11, 40 to 45 is that increase of knowledge that prepares God's people to stand in the latter days. It's the increase of knowledge that the 144,000 receive as they are fulfilling Daniel 12 and the parable of the ten virgins and the seven thunders and the fourth angel's message. Line upon line, here little, there little. And then you'll see some comparisons in Daniel 12. The wise are contrasted with the wicked, whereas in the parable of the ten virgins, the wise are contrasted with the foolish. And Proverbs 10.14 says, Wise men lay up knowledge. There's going to be an increase of knowledge, but the mouth of the foolish is near destruction. Hosea 4.6, the very next book in the Bible after Daniel, says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. God's people that are destroyed at the end of the world are destroyed because they lack knowledge. What knowledge? The knowledge that prepares them to stand in the latter days. What is that knowledge? It has to do with the papacy and the Sunday law. And that knowledge parallels the first angel's message when Daniel stood in his lot. There's a message from the book of Daniel dealing with the papacy and the Sunday law that there will be an increase of knowledge that prepares God's people to stand in the latter days. Brothers and sisters, it's the last six verses of Daniel 11. Those verses are important. But when you understand that those verses are paralleling the history of the Millerite movement and that the history of the Millerite movement was purposely sealed up by God himself to be unsealed in this time period, and suddenly you see the last six verses of Daniel 11 are not simply an important passage of prophecy, but they're doing the identical work that was accomplished for the Millerite movement, then you can allow the Holy Spirit to convict you that probation is about to close. Why? Because it's being unsealed. And when is the time that the knowledge gets unsealed? In verse 10 of Revelation 22, seal not the prophecies of the saying of this book, for the time is at hand. And what does the next verse say? Probation closes. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. The fact that you're hearing these things, you may not believe them yet. You haven't had time to test them. But if you test them and see that they're sound, the fact that you're hearing them is demonstrating that Christ is unsealing this truth and Christ unseals his truth just before probation closes. We have one more um, line of prophecy to put upon this in our next presentation after lunch. <coughs> and uh, how much time? Five minutes? Yeah. Twelve minutes. And let me recap it because we're, this is going to be, the next presentation is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be directly connected to this line of prophecy, but it will be, it approach it from a different direction. Here's what we've said so far. First presentation last night, one of the things that we stated was, the Bible teaches that upon the testimony of how many is a thing established? Two. You see something twice in God's word. It is an established truth. This history of 1840 to 1844, according to inspiration, Sister White, was a perfect fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins. But she also said this history would repeat, be repeated again in terms of the parable of the ten virgins. would repeat it again to the very letter. That's one line of truth. The seven thunders. Is this history all over again? And Sister White says the seven thunders represent this same history, but they represent events that transpire at the end of the world. That's two witnesses there that the history of the Millerite movement is repeated to the very letter. And in Revelation 10 itself, in verse 11, when John says, you must prophesy again, correctly understood, there's a third testimony in Revelation 10 all by itself. This whole experience is of verse 1 through 10 is repeated. John, you must go through this experience again. 
the fourth angel's message, correctly understood and applied as Sister White told us we should apply it. The fourth angel's, the third angel's message, fourth angel's message must run parallel with the first and second angel's message. When you look correctly at the fourth angel's message, you see that it's not a repeat of history. It's just an illustration of the final fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins and the final fulfillment of the seven thunder. That's a fourth line of prophecy. In Daniel 12, the characteristics of Daniel 12 is that there's a wise and wicked group that are going to be alive when knowledge from the book of Daniel is unsealed. There's going to be an increase of this knowledge, and this increase of knowledge is going to lead those people through a purification process. That happens in the Millerite time period. It happens at the end of the world. Upon the testimony of two, the thing is established. That's five, and along the way, along the way, Sister White has pointed to other lines of prophecy that, that agree with this. Malachi. Uh, there, there are, this is just some of the lines of prophecy that deal with this history. And what was the quote that we looked at where Sister White says, the Lord does not repeat things that are of no minor consequence, no great consequence? When the Lord repeats something, he is emphasizing its importance. He doesn't just repeat this history. He repeats the truth that this history is fulfilled again at the end of the world. That's what he's emphasizing more than anything else. We're in that time period. Brothers and sisters, in 1989, correctly understood, Daniel 1140 is identifying that a power from the bottomless pit came to its end. That's exactly what happened on August 11th, 1840. At the same time this is fulfilled, it's identifying that the papacy has begun its work of returning to the throne of the earth. That's what we're going to take up in, a, in this afternoon and tomorrow. See, the papacy, Jesus is the first and the last. Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. He's the Alpha, the Omega. Jesus illustrates the end of Adventism with the beginning of Adventism. And Jesus illustrates the end of the papacy with the beginning of the papacy. And that is the message. There's going to be an increase of knowledge upon the papacy under Sunday law. And if you're going to understand the message of how the papacy takes once again control of the earth, then you need to understand how the papacy took control of the earth in the first go-around. Because Jesus portrays the end from the beginning. That's what we'll be looking, up at, looking at uh, afterwards. But brothers and sisters, in 1989, the fourth angel came down. Fourth angel has two voices. I'm not saying the loud cry. You see the loud cry comes Sunday law. Fourth angel came down. And how much time? Let me run something by you. Just relax. This is outside the scope of this study, but I'll run something by you. Um, if you want to, if you want to read this slowly in our March newsletter, and you can sign up on our mailing list if you're not on it. In our March newsletter, which isn't mailed out yet, we've, we do this quick this presentation, which I'm going to do very quickly. This isn't widely recognized in Adventism. It may not be recognized at all. But in Bible prophecy, when a kingdom is going down, you see the number four illustrated. In, uh, let me show you, Daniel. 11 verse 2. Daniel 11 verse 2 says, And now will I show you the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the four shall be far richer than they all. Go read the book Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith. He will tell you there wasn't really four kings that stood up from this point in history. I think there was 16. There was 16, but this verse only identifies four. But Uriah Smith says, that's not a problem. The Lord identifies who the Lord wants to identify. And these four kings of Persia were the kings that, that started the historical process of drawing Greek, the Greek Empire, into the struggle to take control of the world. These four kings appear in this prophecy to identify that the Medes and the Persians are going off the scene of history. And then Greece rises. And who's the king of Greece? Alexander the Great. And when he was strong, what happened? He drank himself to death, and his king was divided to how many generals? Four. Four. Was it? How many generals were actually there when Alexander died? A whole bunch. And the king of first was supposed to descend to his family. 
but inspiration only identifies four. Then you come to the kingdom of Rome. The trumpets in Revelation are identifying how the Roman Empire was brought to demise. Read the book Daniel Revelation by your eyes, Smith. This is pioneer understanding. The first four trumpets were the powers that brought down Western Rome. Eastern Rome came down in the fifth trumpet. And when the last emperor, Constantine the last of Eastern Rome, surrendered, Revelation tells us that there were four angels loosed at the Euphrates. Every time a kingdom comes down in Bible prophecy, you see the number four. It's four kings in Persia, four generals in Greece, four trumpets in Western Rome, four angels loosed in Eastern Rome. When the Ottoman Empire came down, what was the sign that the fulfillment of August 11th, 1840, is that the last power, the last leader of Turkey surrendered his authority over to who? The four great European kings. And when modern Babylon comes down, in Revelation 7, what's loosed? The four angels let loose the four winds of strife. And modern Babylon comes down. When a kingdom comes down in Bible prophecy, the number four is illustrated. In 1989, brothers and sisters, the fourth angel came down. Thank you. There's so many ways to demonstrate from prophecy that this history has already begun. It's already underway. The difference between this history and us today is they were Philadelphians and we are there this morning very difficult to awaken us. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for a morning of study. And uh, I'm aware that we've, we've put a lot of information out. And I want to thank you for, for the information and ask that your Holy Spirit would Convict us each to test these things. Reject if, reject if it's not true and accept if it is true. And uh, even though we may be overloaded here, we ask that you would strengthen us in this little break we're going to take here that we can continue on with the other studies today. Uh, Lord, we believe that, I believe, many believe, that the Millerite time period is fulfilled to the very letter. And we know in that time period that the people that were ultimately going to be among the wise came under conviction that they needed to understand the secrets of your word. They began to search for them as hidden treasures and they would spend days and evenings searching your word. We ask that this experience would be repeated with us here at this time period, that we begin to do the work of coming to understanding this increase of knowledge, that it might prepare us to stand in these latter days. We ask in Jesus' name.